Hi. Please open your Bibles to the first chapter of the Gospel of John. We're in the second study on John chapter 1. And as you're turning, uh, I don't want to confuse you or anything, so please know that I, I usually read in the New King James translation of the Bible, and I also like to study using the Amplified Version. You'll hear me read both of those. And uh, it's, it Amplified's a little more wordy, but it brings multiple meanings to the words and phrases uh, to bring up fuller meanings. And for a flyover reading or for quick readings, I do like to use the New Living Translation. So let's get right into John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, last week, we study the first five verses in depth. We learn that when we know how the world began and who began it, it makes all the difference in our worldview, giving meaning to all lives and helping us to know what is really true and why it matters. We also found there is an eyewitness to that creation, God, Halloween, who loves us enough to share with us how he created everything and that he himself both gives and sustains that life. As we read the Bible, we see all different kinds of people that God uses, yet there is a unity of purpose that emerges. We discover that such a diversity and unity within is within God himself, as we see God the Father, God the Son, and Jesus. God, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, each participating in creation with specific tasks, yet completely being one in the fullness of God. We found that in John, in John chapter 1, Jesus was referred to as Logos in the Greek. We translate that as the word in English. This clearly indicates in the original language that he was divine and his mission was to communicate or express the infinite heart of God to the comparatively finite understanding of men. We saw the unmistakable finite uh, understanding of man and the evidences that show that Jesus the Christ was and is God. We also concluded that we can trust the Bible above everything else. As we dug deeper, we saw how the divine life that is in Jesus is also the light of men to illuminate our darkness. As the light shines in the dark hearts of men, they may not understand the light. They may not make use of all of the benefits of the light and even be unreceptive of that light, but they'll never be able to overpower the light. That's because the very nature of light causes darkness to flee, and once that light shines on our selfish deeds and rebellion against God, there's only one honest thing we can do, and that is to repent, basically meaning to change our mind and accept the truth of God, allow Him to work out the marvelous plan that He has for each one of us. So don't be afraid to make the change, to follow Jesus, but rather prepare to embrace the love and forgiveness that will bring us the eternal life God wants for us. So now let's continue studying where we finished last time in John chapter 1. Verse 6, there was a man who was sent from God whose name was John. Verse 7, this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. In verse 8, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So who is this John person? Well, if we're in the book of John, and at first glance we might think that John is the author of this book. But reading further, we realize it's not the case. We see that this is referring to 
John the Baptizer. Now, some people call him John the Baptist, but since the First Baptist Church wasn't formed until 1,600 years later, when John Smythe and Thomas Helwes broke away from the Church of England and started the Baptist sect in Amsterdam, we know that's not the case. So let's look at another gospel account to find out the beginnings of John the Baptizer, and that would be in the book of Luke. Now, Luke was a doctor who had a passion for accuracy and details and, and thoroughly searched out the truth to let people know and, and wrote, recorded that in the book of Luke. It's in Luke chapter 1. He not only tells about John being born, but also confirms that he could have only been sent by God given the supernatural events around his birth. I encourage you to read the entire story from Luke because it's amazing. Now, here's a summary. A priest named Zacharias went to serve in the temple. An angel of the Lord appeared to him and told him that his elderly wife, who never could have children, that they would indeed have a baby. They would name him John. They would rejoice and he would be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born. The angel also told him he would prepare people to ready themselves for the Messiah and that John would come in the spirit and power of the prophet of old time, Elijah. Now, I'm not sure how you would react if you heard such a thing, but even at my relatively young age, I would have my own doubts about my wonderful wife having another baby. But the angel of the Lord caused Zacharias to become speechless because he doubted the angel. The angel told me he would not be able to speak until all of these things had happened. So when he came out of the temple, he couldn't speak, and everybody around him realized that something had gone on, something different had happened, and he'd seen a vision. He went home and, of course, had relations with his wife, and in a few days, she conceived, and then she went and hid herself for five months because it was so crazy that this old woman was now going to have a baby. Now, several months later, the angel... Gabriel came to a virgin named Mary and told her how she was going to have a baby, Jesus, and also revealed to her that her elderly cousin, Elizabeth, had conceived and was in her sixth month, sixth month of pregnancy. And since the angel knew that this was not humanly possible, in verse 36, he told her, for with God, nothing will be impossible. So a few days later, Mary went out found her cousin, Zacharias and Elizabeth, and as soon as Mary greeted Elizabeth, the unborn baby in Elizabeth's womb, John was literally jumping up and down. He was moving because he was knew he was in the presence of the Lord. And Elizabeth became filled with the Holy Spirit, gave a beautiful blessing to Mary, which told exactly what Jesus would be doing as the promised Messiah and Savior of the world. So Mary, the pregnant mother of Jesus, stayed with Elizabeth about three more months, and when it was almost time for the baby to be born, for John to be born, Mary went home. Now, Elizabeth had the baby, and when it became time for her to name the baby, all the relatives gathered around, and they figured he'd be named Zacharias. They usually named the kid after his dad, first, first child, or at least give him the name of one of his other relatives, as was the tradition at the time. But the mother, Elizabeth, said, nope, he's going to be called John. This became an issue. So Zacharias, still not able to speak, motioned for something to write down. And he wrote down, his name is John. And they were amazed. Immediately, Zacharias began praising God and giving the glory to God because God had fulfilled his promise. The Savior was on the way. And now he could talk again, just like the angel had promised would happen. Now, Zacharias then was also filled with the Holy Spirit and gave an incredible prophecy about John and how he would prepare for the way for the Lord. And, and in Luke 1, verse 79, he concludes with, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet to a way of peace. A lot of light in these verses, a lot of light in the first chapter of John and in the birth of uh, John and Jesus Christ. Now, there's so much in that chapter. I want to almost want to go start teaching Luke chapter 1, but I'm going to hold back. Uh, I just want to point out that the act of being filled with the Holy Spirit was only something that happened at rare times. Sometimes it was hundreds of years between that happening, and usually it happened to prophets for specific purposes that God had established. And yet within three months, we see three 
seemingly plain and ordinary people that became filled with the Holy Spirit and they confirmed wonderful things that were getting ready to happen. Now we have a life lesson here that is simply God uses ordinary people to do amazing things. God uses ordinary people to do amazing things. As you see in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did not come and live inside believers in God or even live in the prophets of God. But we, we read a number of times that the Spirit of the Lord came upon a prophet or spoke through the prophet and once in a while actually did enter and fill a prophet for a specific writing or a speech or speaking that had to be done on behalf of the Lord God. We even see that with King David, uh, after David sinned with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah and that whole episode, he, he begged the Lord not to take the Holy Spirit from him. You see, the, the Holy Spirit had inspired and spoke through David so many times to write so many of the inspirational and prophetic Psalms, but the Holy Spirit was not living permanently in David. <laughs> it's pretty obvious because of the things that we see in this episode of his life, uh, his dereliction of duty. Uh, during a war, uh, the adultery he committed, the murder he committed to cover that up, uh, all the other cover-ups and the lies that he had to tell. The Holy Spirit definitely was not living in King David at that time. So, these three people, these three times where the people were filled with the Holy Spirit were just a sampling of things that were yet to come. So, yes, there was about to be a major shift of the workings of God on our planet. So, buckle your seatbelts, okay? Enjoy the ride. As, as we continue traveling through the book of John, we'll learn more about the Holy Spirit, who he is, what his work on earth is through the Christian era, and why it is a blessing beyond words to invite him to work in our lives, too. Now, let me mention at this point that the Holy Spirit filling you is not something to think of as weird or, or to be afraid of by any means. The, the reason I say this is because you may have seen something on TV or or been in a meeting somewhere where there's some strange things going on and they called it the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll just say that not everything people claim is from God is really from God. And not everything that people claim is of the Holy Spirit is really of the Holy Spirit. The scriptures are quite clear and they give us several reasons why the Holy Spirit fills us. Honestly, I would be very wary of any activity attributed to the Holy Spirit that's not spelled out in the Bible. So let's take a quick look and see what are the activities of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us the Holy Spirit gives us power to witness and bring the message of deliverance to the lost people of the world. That's exactly what why John the baptizer was filled from the time before he was even born. His entire life was devoted for one purpose. That was to point people to God's promised Messiah, to Jesus. In Matthew 3.11, the Bible also tells us the Holy Spirit will help make us pure, purify our hearts. In Acts 4.29-31, we see the Holy Spirit gives us boldness to proclaim the gospel message. There are several verses in John that let us know that through the Holy Spirit, God will always be with us and never forsake us. Forsake us. We'll see the Holy Spirit also brings us into a deeper relationship with God the Father and helps us to experience His presence. Several more verses in John and 1 Corinthians show us that the Holy Spirit leads us into understanding the truth of the Word of God. In Matthew and Mark, and even in Romans, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit gives us the same authority that Christ had to overcome darkness in multiple ways. We're also taught in John that we worship God in spirit and in truth. And that's why when we're worshiping the Lord and, and when you're listening to the teaching of His Word, Oftentimes, you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit right alongside you, encouraging you, prompting your heart, and nudging you closer to God. Now, First and Second Corinthians are the two books that basically tell you how to have church and how not to have church. As you, stu as you study through them, you'll see that the Holy Spirit enables us to operate using the various gifts that God uses powerfully in the operation of the church, and that is the church of Jesus, the, the real church, the people that love the Lord Jesus Christ, and also in a local body of believers. Now, there will be more time to dig into all of this later on, but back to our, our study today, we know that the infilling of John 
the baptizer, was to proclaim the coming of the Messiah and to prepare people to repent and, and look towards God. Now, by the way, how would you like to have been Elizabeth or, or, or Zacharias knowing that your son was filled with the Holy Spirit even from three months before he was born? First time it ever happened in history. Um, must have been quite an experience to see that young man grow up. But that's something we'll have to wait for and ask them about when we get to heaven, because really after this point in time, we don't hear from either one of them anymore. We do know that John lived in the desert because Luke 1 80 tells us, So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation or his revelation to Israel. Now, some people think that John's family uh, may have also fled to the deserts of Egypt, just as Jesus' family did when Herod sent out the decree to kill every baby boy under two years old. They were very close in age. This may have happened. Honestly, we're not sure. Either way, it's likely that John's parents, who were already elderly when he was born, had both died well before John began his public ministry as an adult. He could have also made his home in the southern part of Israel, which even today is still mostly desert. But there is a lot of desert in Israel, especially uh, during that time, during the first century. Now, it's interesting because that goes right into what Isaiah verse three, uh, chapter 40, verse 3 prophesied that John would be the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. It was tragic that John probably did not have his parents with him very long in life. But our life lesson today on, on this point is the Lord uses tra tragic events in our lives to help many others find the light and love of Jesus Christ. The Lord uses tragic events in our lives to help many others find the light and the love of Jesus Christ. So we know who John is, that he was definitely sent from God. Now let's take a look at to why he was here. In speaking of John the baptizer, John chapter 1, verses 7 and 8 continues. Verse 7, This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him, him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Now Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, tell us when John actually started his ministry. Uh, listen for the names of the other people that are here that we haven't heard about yet. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea, the region of Triconitus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, the Bible didn't have to tell us about these other seven officials, the, the Tetrarchs, which is a, a quarter of the region that was being ruled, and, and who was there, and how many years it had been into their reign. But those details are not filler. Um, nothing in the Bible is filler. So you looked and find out why it's there for. And I'm not going to go into the details, but I, I dug in and I checked. And those are historically accurate people and places and years that would be that would fit right into this time frame. And, and they also help you to understand the political and the religious climate of the world that John and Jesus came into. Uh, one of the things we find is that the, the high priests that were named were probably there and approved by not God. Uh, specifically, but approved by the government and those those reigning people that were reigning, so that they would not cross the government. So it was an interesting political situation that, that Christ came into, and that John started preaching in before Christ came. Now, lucky for you, I'm going to wrap this up in just a few minutes. So uh, I just want to encourage you to take some time this week and dig into Wikipedia. Probably online is the easiest place to go, but. Look at Luke chapter 1, study out John's um, origins, and also Luke chapter 3, where it talks about the beginning of his ministry. And, and, and look at some of those people and, and 
the region they ruled and some of the details. It's, uh, it's a lot of good stuff in there. You'll find out that all of it was lined up and, and God made it perfect timing for Jesus to be revealed. Now, let's go back to John. You'll discover John had a public ministry of just a few years. And many, many people over that time repented and were baptized in preparation for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And though John was filled with the Holy Spirit, it appears that he didn't even know that his main mission and message in life was, as we know now, to proclaim that Christ was coming. Um, we just found out in Luke that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and told him to go and do this. And so as the son of a Jewish priest, all those years got leading up to this time, probably around 30 years uh, old when he started his ministry, I believe he studied the scriptures. I believe he dug into them and, and looked for the true meanings of the scriptures and, and realized that the religious system of the time had strayed very far from the heart of God over these years. And I believe he preached boldly that everyone needed to repent from the, the evil and prepare their hearts for the true kingdom of God. We'll see here that he was definitely not. John was not the promised Messiah, nor did he even realize that his second cousin, Jesus, was the Messiah until God chose to publicly reveal it to John and everyone else that was there at his baptism, which we'll study here in just a few weeks. Spoiler, spoiler alert, right? But the life lesson in all of this is the Holy Spirit reveals truth to us as we need to know it, not too soon and not too late. The Holy Spirit reveals truth to us as we need to know it, not too soon and not too late. Now, we'll discover next time the various aspects of the light that John pointed to as Jesus came into the world, but you don't have to wait till next week to discover that light. In short, we find that in John 5.24, Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. The Bible teaches us how to have a true, meaning, meaningful, lasting relationship with God. It all starts when you realize how much God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's recorded in John chapter 3, verse 16. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it tells us, it reminds us, we don't need to be told, it reminds us that all are sinners. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then a few verses later, it tells us that God has a remedy for that sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God... <coughs> The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. That's what John 1.12 said that we read just a few minutes ago. Now, as you're listening to God speaking these words, you may wonder, can I be saved? And Romans 10.13 gives us that good news. And it says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You may be saved now, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10.9 says, truly, truly, I say, excuse me, that was Romans 10.9. John 5.24 says, truly, truly, I say to you, and this is Jesus talking, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. You can talk to God through prayer. Just share your heart with him. He wants to hear from you. To begin your new life of faith, or if you feel far from God and you want to renew your relationship with God, I encourage you to pray a simple prayer right now out loud, such as this. God, I confess that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. I'm in need of salvation. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again to bring me a new life. I ask to receive your forgiveness and grace. I choose to follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you sincerely prayed from your heart, 
the Bible says that all your sins have been forgiven and forgotten by God, and you're now a child of God. It's awesome. So after making that decision to receive Christ, we want to encourage you to seek a local church or a congregation that will help continue you continue to grow in your relationship with God by teaching and following the clear teachings of the Bible. Please let me know if you prayed that prayer for the first time or if you're renewing your relationship with God today. I'd love to know. I'd love to send you some things that will help you grow in your faith. And as we close, I want to pray a blessing over you that's been blessing believers in God for literally thousands of years. That is, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Hebrew for Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you so much for watching and um, listening in, and we will attempt to do this again in the next few verses as we go through studying the book of John. God bless you.